15 years ago for a drag course. I just loved it and very happy to be back. So, um, So no disclosure to declare. Uh, the outline, I'm going to uh, give a quick uh, glance at Quebec's immunization uh, program and structure. Uh, I'm going to give a few recent examples of innovation in our, our vaccine schedule. Uh, I'm going to go deeper in the case study for HPV uh, program and conclusion. So this is Canada. Uh, Quebec is uh, here. So uh, we're the second largest province in uh, Canada. We have uh, 8 million people in Quebec. Uh, we're mostly a French-speaking uh, province. Uh, we have a birth cohort of 90,000 uh, children. Um, and mostly that uh, the uh, publicly funded pro immunization program in Canada are provincial and territorial uh, responsibility. So uh, we decide on our programs. That's why the, the, the schedules are so different from one province to another. Um, for histo historical and cultural reasons, Quebec has maintained a, a spirit of independence and singularity. We're called like the Gaulois, uh, as uh, they call it in France. We're the Gaulois of the Canada. Uh, this spirit, coupled with a sense of efficient use of limited resources, animates governmental uh, policies in general and public health policies in particular. So we're, we're perceived as cheap in Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our decision-making process. Uh, I work at the MESS here in the, the public health direction. Uh, we, close, we work closely with the Quebec Public Health Institute, where uh, FDB works. Uh, and in this institute, there's a, the, our NITAG, uh, the Quebec Immunization Committee, I'll call it SIC for the rest of the presentation. SIC, uh, <laughs> Comité sur l'immunisation du Québec. <laughs> it's not sick like malade. <laughs> <laughs> So, and we have 18 regional public health uh, in uh, Quebec, and this, there is uh, where the program implementation is done. Uh, the vaccine are given by public health in 80% of cases, and physicians give, give uh, 20%, mostly in urban uh, uh, cities, uh, regions. So CIC, Comité sur l'Union du Québec, it's the advisory committee to uh, the Ministry of Health for program to implement or to modify. Um, it's a multidisciplinary uh, committee with active liaison members like, such as uh, pediatric or infectious uh, disease, uh, whatever, and ex officio member. I am one of the ex officio. So uh, this is a, a, an easy way to see things coming and be able to prepare ourselves. Uh, they've been using the Eric's in the Walls framework. I guess uh, there's a lot of frameworks out there, but this is the one they use in Quebec because of Philippe de Walls, <laughs> that's on uh, the SIC committee. Um, it, but it, it's been used since 2001, so it's been 16 years of, uh, of use. Um, as you probably know, in these uh, frameworks, uh, we especially, for, 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 for the Ministry of Health, the acceptability, equity, uh, and the uh, cost uh, effectiveness are very important for us. So it's part of the, the framework. Um, it's different from the, uh, the national uh, NACI committee, the Canadian committee, because up to now, they didn't uh, look at the econo economic uh, uh, part of the, uh, the recommendations. Um, recommendations are reached by consensus. Uh, there's a broader consultant uh, process uh, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, done after the, uh, the, the first uh, statement. And uh, they also provide recommendations uh, on the need of uh, research and program evaluation to the ministry. So the SIC has mostly a population, populational uh, perspective more than an individual one. In the MES, in the ministry, we do the decision making, uh, we plan and implement, uh, we fund, uh, including program evaluation and monitoring. Since 2001, uh, we, uh, set up, we, we set up uh, a percentage of uh, every uh, new program, uh, the budget of it, every new program we implement. So uh, it, it can vary from one to 3%, depending on the program and what's been done before. 
and uh, following sick immunization uh, recommendations, the uh, ministry decides on which project they will, uh, they will uh, fund. Uh, and normally we focus on acceptability, effectiveness and cost effectiveness. So recent examples, uh, you probably know about the pneumococcal vaccination schedule, a two plus one. Uh, to four and 12 months. We were the first in the world to implement, implement this, uh, this schedule. Uh, but now, I, as, as you must know, there's a lot of countries that do have this, uh, this schedule. So it was implemented into, in uh, December 2004 and was based on immunogenicity data, but mostly on the result of a case control study in, uh, that was uh, done in US because they had a vaccine shortage uh, and they had people that were vaccinated, one, two, three, or four doses. So. It was really interesting. We, we, we uh, sick called the, those, the, the people in CDC and asked, uh, you should do a, a study on this uh, vaccine effectiveness study. And that showed that two was almost like three, was almost like four in, for the effectiveness. So based on this, we did a cost effectiveness study and, and, and arrived at the conclusion that the two plus one would be a good choice. Uh, but we followed it with a thorough evaluation and monitoring program, including a case control vaccine effectiveness study, uh, and it's still ongoing, so it's been like uh, 13 years. Uh, the good thing is that when we implemented, it was with PCV7, uh, and then in 2009, uh, we switched to PCV10, and 2011, PCV13. So we have like a, like, a mixture of a schedules uh, that, uh, that are very interesting to study. And uh, for those reasons, the, pro the program is currently under review. Hepatitis B program in school, uh, we implemented in 1994 with a three-dose schedule. Um, but we were wondering if we could optimize that program. So uh, SICK uh, recommended uh, to put in place an immunogenicity study. Uh, comparing uh, three uh, schedules, three different schedules. The first one is the schedule that we had at that time, this one. And uh, the two other schedules was uh, doubling the Recombivax at, with a two-dose schedule and a Twinrix pediatric and two-dose schedule. So we decided that was interesting and we, <laughs> we could save money with that. So uh, that showed that there was high immunogenicity and zero protection rates for all three schedules. And uh, based on a cost effectiveness study that showed that the three schedules were favorable, uh, the, co the cost for quality were very good, we chose the, uh, the, the hepatitis A and B uh, schedule because we had the advantage of the hepatitis A uh, portion, even though we're, not, uh, we're a low endemic uh, province for hepatitis A. Uh, and the program was changed in 2008 with the introduction of HPV vaccination. I quote impact because it's not a really impact data, but uh, recently we, we, uh, the SIG showed us uh, data from, from this program. So you see here it's before implementation in the uh, children age 11, 17 years of, of age, we had 27 cases and post uh, implementation in the non-eligible cohorts, we had 15 cases and four in the eligible cohorts. For what it's worth, uh, it's, re it's interesting, but we'll see in the next uh, few years how it goes. So for the HPV program, um, as all of you, uh, we, uh, in Canada, the licensure, the four-valent HPV vaccine was done in 2006. Uh, with a three-dose schedule. The step we took at that time, again, for uh, all our pro new programs, it was the recommendations from the expert, planning, implement implementation, and monitoring evaluation. So for the scientific recommendation, in 2007, there was a Canadian workshop uh, that was uh, held to identify um, uh, HPV research questions, and it was ranked by their importance. Uh, that workshop uh, told us that the two plus one schedule was ranking number one in Canada. So wanted to, to have a, a response on this. So uh, after that, the, the SICK committee invited other experts around the table that aren't usually there. So the OB uh, gynecologist, the uh, sexual trans trans transmitted uh, infection, cancer anthropology experts to, uh, to make recommendations. They used, again, the Erickson-DeWall's framework, uh, which has uh, 13 dimensions. 
um, such as program goal. At that time, the, pro the program goal was uh, the prevention of cervical cancer and precancer, um, the burden of disease, vaccine character characteristics, uh, possible strategies, uh, including the two plus one uh, schedule, cost effectiveness and acceptability. So uh, to do the, these recommendations, uh, SICK recommended to uh, fund uh, studies. One of them was the acceptability of uh, physicians and po population, which was funded and that showed the uh, high support. And uh, for sure, again, the cost effectiveness and modeling uh, studies uh, for different strategies, again, including the two plus one uh, schedule. So at that time, uh, when the recommendation, when we got the recommendation, uh, SICK recommended us uh, uh, two dose uh, unique schedule, two dose at six months interval in grade four, and one dose at 60 months, if it's not in, but if needed, in grade nine. Uh, uh, so five years later, uh, and they called it the extended schedule. Um, they recommended a catch-up in grade nine with three doses and vaccine free of charge up to 18 years of age. Why did they do that? So for immuno immunological reasons, uh, they felt that the vaccine was very immunogenic, uh, much more than for natural, infe than natural infection. Uh, they felt that the, not they felt, they had studies showing the, the Im immune response at 9 to 11 years of age were uh, especially good. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 it was reach, the, the tighter reached after two days in that age was higher than for women uh, 16 to 25 uh, in three dose schedule uh, with, uh, in whom uh, we, we showed efficacy. Um, they, 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 they talked about the principle of spacing doses that uh, shows generally that, the, 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 that it would heal higher antibody titers when you space those. Zero two is less good than zero six. And reactivation of immune memory with a booster dose like five years later would uh, increase protection for women at the, at the time, uh, for those girls uh, at the time they needed the most. And finally, for operational uh, reasons, because we, we already had programs in grade four for each, uh, hepatitis B, as I showed, and uh, Tdap in grade nine. And as uh, was said yesterday, school programs uh, show better compliance. So we implemented, uh, based on that, in 2008, we did an extensive consultation before implementation because of this unique schedule. So we wanted to be sure that we would have a consensus, people will, uh, will, uh, will be behind. Uh, we, g we gave appropriate good funding for resources to vaccinate and more monitoring and evaluation. Um, and we have a lot of already good tools uh, for us. It was a Quebec immunization protocol. It's the Bible in Quebec. Every vaccine providers uh, have, have this under their hands. We did a lot of training and uh, tools, uh, as, as you know, uh, the, 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 the things we do when we implement. And in the first year, uh, the uptake was 80% in grade four, 81 in grade nine, and 70% for the, the, uh, the, uh, the 15 to 17 that had the vaccine free of charge, but wasn't vac weren't vaccinated in school. So it was very high. Uh, in the rest of Canada, it was about uh, 60 to 70% at most at that time. So for monitoring and evaluation for us, it's very important. It's a moral responsibility, but more than that, we have a legal mandate in our law. Um, we gave a specific mandate to uh, Quebec Public Health Institute to, uh, to, uh, for a proposal for a, an evaluation plan. So they, they came up with a very comprehensive plan on multiple dimensions. I'm just going to state a few of them because it was like a, this, uh, this big. Um, they, they recommended an immunological study and efficacy data uh, to see if the third dose was needed or not. And this was done in collaboration with Canadian BC colleagues. Uh, they recommended that a randomized trial, uh, Cervix Gardasil, again, to be able to optimize eventually the program because one of these vaccines is less expensive than the other. Uh, they recommended uh, to, uh, to f do the surveillance for vaccine coverage and adverse events, for sure. Uh, a study on the impact of program on HPV prevalence in 15 to 26 years old. 
uh, that showed that was done like two years ago and showed a, a marked reduction in HPV 16 in that in that uh, those uh, women. And uh, last one here is the, the study on the impact of program on sexual behaviors uh, that showed again that there's no impact of, of the program on sexual behavior. And that was done, uh, we, we just had the results a few months ago. So all these studies uh, we funded because we thought it, there, it was very important to have those responses and much more, I, I don't have the time to go into that now. So the key elements for, this, for the successes we, we have here uh, are that the roles and responsibility of every, each stakeholders, uh, like researchers, industry, policymakers, academia, academia, vaccine providers are very well defined. We've been working that way since, uh, again, 16 years, so everybody knows what they have to do in, in that. Um, appropriate funding, I'll never say it enough, it's uh, fundamental and it has to be there from beginning to the end. Uh, we have enhanced collaboration and very open communication between all, all these people at each steps, uh, prepare, preparation of the statement, implementation, evaluation, uh, rigorous methods and transparency for, for us leads to uh, increase of confidence in the decision-making process. So I think uh, this is important, again, for every stakeholder. Um, we need to adjust when new data comes, uh, com comes out, and usually we do it uh, in, a, in, a, in a fast, uh, a, a good way. Um, like the, when we, we realized that the third dose wasn't necessary because of the studies that were done, th there was a change in program in 2013. Uh, we, had, we have a two-dose schedule uh, since then. Um, recently, in the past years, uh, there have been a lot of media coverage, uh, controversies, as you all had, and we had a death in, uh, in a teenager, 14-years uh, girl. And, and she died to, like two weeks after the second dose, and this, this was really bad. Uh, so we, we had a, a, a vaccine coverage down five points at that time, and we asked, uh, we had to react to that to do something, so we asked the, the, the institute uh, to do a, a, a research uh, into school to see uh, the successes and pitfalls in, in, in school, what, what explained the, 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 this, uh, this uh, vaccine coverage that was going down. And this was done in 2016. Eve was uh, responsible for this study. And now it's uh, the step two of the study and to try to, uh, to put in place uh, new strategies to try to increase the vaccine coverage. So, so it's good. there's going to be, again, evaluation of that. And we're going to learn from, uh, from these things. So in conclusion, um, I think uh, the in integration of research into policies and practices at all stages are a win-win situation for everybody. Um, the vaccine programs we have in Quebec are really tailored for our needs, and it's, I think it's, it's one of the reasons. Uh, for sure, we're wondering, is it individually driven or organizational? Is it the individual that are in place that, uh, that uh, does that? So it's really a challenge as sustain sustainability. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave eventually. Uh, Eve's going to leave eventually, so it, will it stay? Uh, uh, forever, so this is a, a challenge. Uh, so I think integration must be institu institutionalized as much as possible, but it does not preclude to have a dedicated, and I heard here a lot, passionate people around the table. So uh, that's it, uh, if you have any questions or... <laughs> I thank you very much for your attention.